Good morning. Welcome to Belmont Chapel's Sunday morning online service. It's great that you are watching. My name is Saz Flint. I'm one of the leaders of this church. And right now, if you are watching this live, many others of our church family are meeting face to face in our building in the city centre. But I am glad that wherever you are, you can join with us online this morning. Please say hello in the chat box if you haven't already done so. And please, if you are new to Exeter, new to church or new to Belmont, go to our website, belmontchapel.org.uk and fill in a contact form. It can't have escaped your notice that the American presidential elections are coming up and we are praying for a peaceful outcome. This week, I heard a story about a past American president. The story goes that there was a soldier sitting outside the White House one day, crying uncontrollably. A young boy saw him weeping and asked, sir, what is wrong? The soldier replied, I was really hoping I could see President Lincoln. We've got this devastating situation and only the president is powerful enough to intervene and save the lives of my people, but they won't let me in. The young boy took the soldier's hand and said, come with me. They then proceeded to walk past the sentry at the gate and straight into the White House, past the guards. Then they walked right into the president's office and the little boy said, Dad, this soldier needs to speak with you. Do you need to speak with a powerful, loving, heavenly father today? Let us metaphorically take you by the hand this morning and walk you into the presence of God. Not because I or anyone else you will see on this screen is that powerful, but because we believe in Jesus Christ, who gives us access to a loving, powerful, heavenly father who is so faithful. This week, I was lucky enough to be able to visit my hometown, the place where I first met the living Lord Jesus, where I was baptized into the church, where I became one of his people. And every time I go back, I'm reminded God is faithful. He is faithful to his people in good times and hard times. So we're gonna pray to him now before we sing about how faithful he is. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, your word says, God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Thank you for your call to us, Lord. Thank you that we can come to an almighty, loving, heavenly Father, Lord of the universe, through the fellowship of Jesus. May we be led today by the hand of Jesus into the presence of God. Be with us wherever we are, in whatever light or darkness we find ourselves in. Show yourself to be faithful, powerful, loving. We are here to listen to you. We are here to love you. We are here to worship you. Amen.
Let us pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, and in the power of your Holy Spirit to intercede for your world. But first, we remember who you are. You are the God of all glory, besides whom all of creation's beauty, its occasional magnificence, and its moments of intimacy and tenderness pale into insignificance. We remember your glory and pray that in all these things, your people may see and acknowledge you. We pray for the world, for our, our nation, our city, and our church. The coronavirus pandemic is still, after all these months, still the issue that dominates the news and many of our lives. We pray for all of those seeking to make the best decisions in the face of seemingly impossible dilemmas. We pray for health workers, we pray for carers, we pray for the vulnerable who are suffering most in this situation. Father, we pray that an antiviral treatment may be found soon and that it will be sufficiently effective to enable us to resume normal human contact in our workplaces, with our families and friends, and with those with whom we, we worship and pray. Father, we pray particularly for the United States of America at this time, as it faces an increasingly polarised election on the 3rd of November next. We pray for more moderation than we have seen so far in the final weeks of campaigning. And we ask that despite all the fears of so many commentators, that the process will end peacefully and in good order. Specifically, Lord, we remember Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, as she seeks to come to terms with the recent foiled attempt to kidnap her. We pray for her and her family, and we pray she may continue to lead her state without fear and with wisdom. We pray also for those parts of our world where there is war and civil unrest. We pray for the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and particularly we lift to you your people in nagorno karazakh who worshipped at the cathedral that has been destroyed there in the recent bombing. We ask that they will continue to praise you in the midst of their grief and that in, the, in, their, in their trust to, with you and in the midst of this act of destruction, they will find the courage and the grace to continue to honour you. As we think of our country, we are grateful for all the good things that we have here. We thank you for our Prime Minister and we pray for him as he leads us and makes critical decisions for our future. We thank you too for our Leader of the Opposition as he seeks to show statesmanship and moderation as he challenges the government. We pray for him particularly as he faces opposition and division in his party and his supporters. We pray that he will have the wisdom and clarity to continue to uphold high standards of governance. We thank you for our health workers, our carers and our volunteers who are working so hard in this, at this time. We continue to uphold them as they face increasing numbers of coronavirus victims. We pray for our students and young people particularly as they wrestle with managing their lives in the face of so many competing pressures. We ask that you will give, guide Christian students to, be, to become leaders in balancing the need for human contact the pressure of their peers and their leaders and for their desire to serve in, in, in combating this coronavirus. Father, here in Exeter, we pray for the work of your church. We thank you for the ministry and witness of those working in food bank, seeking to help those struggling to find food, and for those who are working in the uh, Christians Against Poverty, seeking to help those in debt at this particularly challenging time. And Father, I particularly pray for Exeter YMCA as it embarks on its new project to build new homes for the otherwise homeless here in this city. Father, our final intercession is for ourselves in Belmont Chapel. We pray that individually and collectively we may grow in our knowledge and confidence in you. We pray that we may be filled to the measure with the joy of which Paul speaks in his letter to the Philippians. We pray we may grasp more profoundly than we ever have done before just how much greater you are than all else, greater than any of the things for which we pray.
We finish our prayers as we started, remembering who you are. You are the king, the king of creation. You set the stars in the sky and the planets spinning on their courses. As we intercede for these difficult things, we sometimes wonder if you're able to hear and answer our prayers. So we finish by saying, yes, yes, you can. You are much, much greater than all our worries, our strivings and our pain. So in all these things, we pray that, that, that we pray that the glory of Christ may be um, honoured and we may bring you glory in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hi, I'm Michelle and I'll be leading us in our reading today. So grab a Bible and do read with me. We're reading today from Philippians 3, um, verses 1 to 9. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Let's pray for Nick as he comes to speak to us. Father God, thank you for this time to learn together from God's word. I pray for your spirit to be working through Nick and through us all as we listen. Help us to know joy in our obedience and convict us of the places in our lives where we need to change to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we are continuing our look at Paul's letter to the church of Philippi. And this is the fifth instalment of an eight-part series we've called Surprised by Joy. And it's a series that encompasses the whole of the epistle. Now, it may be that you've joined us here this morning online. You've not heard the previous four talks in this series. Well, you'll be pleased to know that you're able to catch up with them if you wish to. You can find the videos of the talks on the Belmont YouTube channel, or alternatively, you can find audio-only versions to stream or download in the talk section of the Belmont website. Now, I wonder if any of you have had occasion recently to write or update your CV. Maybe you're looking to change employment or you've already applied for a new job and you've been asked to provide evidence that you have the necessary experience before attending interview. Or perhaps you've decided to apply for some further academic studies and you've been asked to provide evidence that you have the necessary qualifications before you start the course. The letters CV are a reduction, of course, of the title Curriculum Vitae. Two Latin words that, when joined together, simply mean the course of life. And that's precisely what a CV does. In chronological order, it sets out the course of our lives, all the way from the date and place of our birth to the present moment. And yet, of course, whilst experience and qualifications are often judged as being very important, they can't, by and of themselves, provide an adequate description of a person. Often, on receipt of a job application, you're asked to write a personal statement to go alongside your CV. And it's within that section, of course, that you can write something about your character, your personal circumstances. You can write about the things that motivate you and inspire you, alongside, of course, with the reason why you're exactly the right person for the job that you're applying for. 
By their very nature, of course, CVs and personal statements are all about us. And we make sure, of course, that when we write them, we describe ourselves in the best possible light. Whether it's our own employment record, our experience, our qualifications, or our character. We want to stand out in the crowd. We want to be noticed. We want to have our names placed right at the top of the list. We want all of our achievements to count and all of our qualifications to matter. But, as Paul outlines in this part of his letter to his friends in Philippi, achievements and qualifications, those things that are so often idolised within our society, can produce short-sightedness. If we allow them to dominate our lives, if we become totally absorbed by them, if we become wrapped up in them in such a way that they become everything, then we're in danger of missing out on the only thing that is of true value, that of being in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's spend a few moments this morning, shall we, just tracing something of Paul's argument in the opening verses of this chapter. Now, as we've already seen in this letter, there are divisions and difficulties within the church in Philippi. Some were interpersonal. And Paul has been at pains, hasn't he, to encourage his friends to show love and to care, and care, to reveal a quality of relationship and shared commitment that mirrors Christ's example. But it's not only interpersonal differences that are causing friction. There are those within the church who are teaching false truth. Those who insist that simply following Jesus isn't enough, but that instead there are other essentials as well that need to go alongside. There are rules and regulations to follow. There are practices and principles to adopt. And Paul has particularly strong words to say about those individuals. And he's very direct in his language and in the way that he warns his friends not to be taken in by any of what these false teachers have to say. In the original Greek, the word watch that we have here at the start of verse 2 is repeated three times. Paul is concerned that nothing sidelines the church from the truth, that nothing is allowed to dilute the joy of knowing Christ. So let's read that verse again, shall we? This is Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Watch out for those dogs. Watch out for those evildoers. Watch out for those mutilators of the flesh. And the people that Paul is so outspoken about are a group of Jesus-believing Jews who are teaching that any non-Jew coming to faith, any Gentile, must first adopt all of the rules and the regulations of Judaism as well as being a follower of Jesus. And this is exactly the same problem, of course, that the writer to the Hebrews sought to address. And we've been tracing a very similar argument through that letter as well in our evening teaching series. And it's not that Paul is denying their religion. It's not that he's speaking against it. As we will see, Paul describes himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews in verse 5. But instead, Paul's point is this. It's that following Jewish law and practices aren't in and of themselves a gateway to being accepted by God. External identification whether by circumcision or law-keeping, are no replacement at all for the inner change that comes through knowing Christ and being indwelt by God's Spirit. Becoming a Christian didn't make Paul less of a Jew. In fact, of course, it made him a completed Jew, a true child of Abraham, both physically and spiritually. Listen to some other words that Paul wrote when he wrote to some of his friends in the church in Galatia. This is what he had to say. This is Galatians chapter 3, and verses 6 to 9. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. The true people of God, says Paul, are those who recognise that reality and rejoice in the freedom that it brings. Not those who believe that godliness can be achieved through rule keeping. You see, it's not about ritual, says Paul. Instead, it's all about relationship. 
Paul makes his point in verse 3. Listen to verse 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. It's not about what I can do, says Paul. It's all about what Christ has done. And the problem, says Paul, is one of confidence. You see, it's always tempting, isn't it, to place our faith and our trust in something we can see, in something that we can feel, something that's tangible, something that's physical. But, says Paul, there's a spiritual reality which is far greater, a reality that the law only points towards, and that reality is Christ. And so in order to refute the claims of these Jewish Christian Paul produces his CV, a CV that by Jewish standard was exemplary, a CV that would get him noticed, a CV that would ensure that his name was placed at the top of any list. If anyone has a case, he says, for self-confidence, then it's me. Let's read again Paul's CV. We find it in the second half of verse four and through into verse six. This is what it says. If others think they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Firstly, Paul says, just look at my family history. Look at where I've come from. Paul was born into a Hebrew family who observed the law closely, not simply a Jew, but most importantly, an Israelite, pure blooded with a familial line that led all the way back to Benjamin. For Paul's readers, that reference would have been particularly significant. Benjamin was the only one of the 13 sons of Jacob that had been born in the promised land. And the Benjamite tribe was the only tribe to remain faithful to God's chosen king, David, following the rebellion of Solomon, his son. King Saul, Israel's first king, was from the tribe of Benjamin. And the name Saul, of course, was Paul's birth name. Paul had the best start in life. No Jew could ask for better. Secondly, says Paul, I went to the best schools. Paul describes himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, which indicates that he spoke both Hebrew and Aramaic. Whereas most likely, of course, the Jewish Christians that Paul was arguing with probably only spoke Greek. Paul attended school in Jerusalem. He was a pupil of one of the most famous Jewish teachers, Rabbi Gamaliel. Paul had the best education. He had A-star qualifications. Thirdly, says Paul, I was a Pharisee. I was a member of the religious elite. Paul followed a devotional calling that bound him to observe hundreds of laws. A Pharisee was someone who was thought to have reached the summit of religious experience. Paul was a devout member of this worshipping community. He defended the truth of his orthodox Jewish faith with a ferocious zeal. He writes, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul had the best church attendance record. He was a credit to the faith. He was a wonderfully devoted worshipper. And yet, as Paul was to discover through personal encounter with the risen Lord Jesus as he traveled northeast out of Jerusalem, going towards Damascus, a story that we read of in Acts chapter 9, all of the things he thought would grab God's attention all of the things that he has observed in order to gain God's approval, all the things that he believed would set him right in God's standing, were in fact useless. He thought he could climb the spiritual ladder. He thought he could get to God by his own actions, by his own efforts. But having the best start in life, being born in a God-fearing country to devout parents, having the best education and a highly thought-of position in society, just simply doesn't cut it. Even his regular attendance at the synagogue, reciting the right words and faithfully pursuing the right truths, none of it was enough. So it's as if God grabs hold of Paul's CV and he tears it up. 
Paul writes this. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. So who or what are we placing our faith in? Whose righteousness are we placing our confidence in? Is it in our own righteousness or in Christ's? In 1697, a team of stonemasons under the leadership of a master architect, Christopher Wren, began the construction of the large central dome that is the most prominent feature of London's St. Paul's Cathedral. And many of the city councillors involved in signing off on the project were unconvinced that such a large dome could support itself. They thought that Wren's design was too daring, that the architect had overstepped himself. So they insisted on a modification. Wren was instructed to build a central column linking the inside top of the dome to the floor below, a stone column of some 300 feet. Wren had little choice, so he had to do what he was asked, despite his insistence that the 65,000 tons of stone didn't need any additional support. But in order to be allowed to complete the commission, he built the column. Many years later, in the mid-19th century, when renovation work was being undertaken, a startling discovery was made. The column that the city councillors had insisted Wren constructed wasn't actually connected to the roof of the dome. Wren had, so it turned out, instructed the stonemasons to leave a gap at the top of the column and the underside of the dome. So whilst the column looked impressive, it did nothing useful. In truth, all it did was obstruct the view of a magnificent piece of work. Now, of course, if you visit St Paul's Cathedral today, you won't see a stone column under the dome. Instead, you'll have an unhindered view of one of the most remarkable pieces of early 18th century architecture. So as we draw to a close this morning, let me just pose you a few questions. I wonder if there are things in our lives that we are working hard at building because we think God will be impressed by them. Or maybe, like those Jewish Christians in Philippi, we simply don't have enough confidence in Christ alone to actually listen to the words of the master craftsman who says that what he has done is sufficient. And what about the things that I am building? Do they only serve to obscure the view? Are there things in my life that are preventing me from having a true appreciation of Christ's work, of his death and his resurrection? And whilst that's an important question to ask, there's a far more vital one, and that's this. Is what I'm building obscuring the view for others? And what about our spiritual CVs? Do they run to a few thousand words? I'd imagine Paul's CV, his most recently updated one following his experience of meeting Christ on the road to Damascus, contained only two words. It mentions a name, but it's not his own. Paul's CV probably reads, Christ alone. Paul concludes this section that we have read with these words. So let's read them again as we finish this morning. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. As we close, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to read from it and to think about what was written so many centuries ago. We thank you for your spirit that indwells each and every one of us and your spirit that just brings alive these words to us. Help us, we pray, to understand something about what we have read today. 
Help us, we pray, not to be building things in our lives that obscure the view of the wonderful work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to know the indwelling power of your Spirit. Help us to have the confidence to live our lives for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
sacrificing grace tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. The boldly we approach. Thank you to everyone who has taken part this morning and thank you to you for watching. If you have any questions about the service or about our church, please go to the website belmontchapel.org.uk and please join us again next week, either in person at church, you can book via the website or here online. Before you go, I have a few things to tell you about. Don't go now because you might miss something good. And also I want to pray a blessing over us before you leave. Next Sunday, we have a great event being run in the building for families with children aged three to 11. And this is instead of our normal online worship. And to come, you will have to book via the website or church week or church suite. Uh, this event for young families is going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. It will be cafe style. 
with family bubbles sitting around tables. There'll be songs and actions, story time, chat time and craft. And rest assured, it will all be in a COVID secure space. And it's only for that age group. So I won't be able to be there because my children are just too old. Please contact Rachel or the church office if you have any questions about it. And straight after I finish speaking now, there is our normal Zoom prayer meeting. The link is in the comments box. It also is in this week's focus. And you can come this evening and join with us for worship, fellowship, and hearing from Andrew about how Jesus has a greater power than anyone. That's on Zoom and the link is in focus or on the website. The service starts at 7 p.m., but you can join from 6.30 onwards. Before I go, let's pray this prayer. And this is from the book of Jude in the New Testament. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Bless you and see you again soon.